Dear Traveller, and welcome. Here we are today, we are looking at the Moskva, the Moskva 5. Now, I believe Moskva basically means Moscow. We're looking at the Moscow 5. Why is, why is it called the 5? Honestly, no idea. Okay, no idea. Anyway, Moskva 5, and that's Mokba in Cyrillic. Okay. Anyway, today we're talking about a medium format rangefinder folding camera made by our mates, by our mates back at KMZ, and produced between, okay, so we're talking about our mates now, 1956 to 1960s. Can I be honest with you right now? Can I just be honest with you? Of the time of recording, right now as I'm recording this, today I saw a 1960s Cadillac. 1960s Cadillac, and I'm telling you, this thing was mean. Like, it was so mean. It was like the meanest looking car I've ever seen in my life. Um, so, so you know, just to give you an idea of what the 1960s were like in America, mean as hell, awesome cars. But here we go, Moskva 5 came out in 1960s. Bang! This is this is where we're at. And I believe um, the Beatles came out in 1960s. Don't quote me on that. Don't quote me on that because I haven't researched it at all. I'm just coming up with this information as I go. So here we go. The Moskva 5 came out in 1956 to 60. Its main difference from the Moskva 4 is the added self-timer. And you know the great thing about self-timers is you either care about them or you don't. That's, that's, <laughs> that's the amazing thing about those things. But there you go. Anyway, the earlier model of the Moskva were copied of the Zeiss Icon Super Iconta C. And I can hear you saying, oh, I don't even know what that means. Okay. Okay. While you're driving or while you're watching this video, whatever, however you view your... Maybe it's like 2 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> you found this... If you found my channel at 2 o'clock in the morning... Um, first off, I want to say... Watch out for 4 o'clock. 4 o'clock or 4.20? I don't know why, but 4.20? <laughs> I'll get the reference. Don't worry, I'll get the reference. But 4.20, I don't know why, but that time in the morning is the worst time in the morning. That's like the witching hour. It's the worst time ever. Life just isn't good at that. So if you've discovered this channel at 2 o'clock in the morning, then you know what? All I can say to you is I hope you get, I hope you get some sleep and... And I'm telling you, I'm telling you the reason why I hope you get some sleep is because tomorrow, <laughs> I'm a little bit embarrassed to say it, but tomorrow is going to be awesome, okay? I know you're starting the day a bit early, I know you, you probably still need to get sleep, but tomorrow is going to be awesome. So here I am chatting to you at 2 o'clock in the morning about the Super Eye Contact, and you're wondering why on earth do I care that this camera was modeled after the Zeiss Super Eye Contact? Oh, I totally get that. And a few years ago, I would have wondered the same thing. A few years ago, I was a normal person, and I did everything normal until I got into photography, and then I got in photography, and then everything went weird, and I started researching all this stuff, and there's so many rabbit holes, you just you can't keep up. But you know what? It's so exciting, it's so fun, it's so exhilarating. So here you are at 2 o'clock in the morning and we are talking about the, the Moskva 5 that was based off the Super Iconta. And you're thinking to yourself, who gives a rat's jats? FYI, in Australia, jats are referred to as crackers. I don't know what that means to the rest of the world, but there you, there you go. So, why do I care that the Moskva 5 was based after the Super Iconta is because of this. KMZ didn't just base their cameras off the, the Zeiss. They actually took the plans for Zeiss. And I know you're thinking, hey, hey, that's, that's dirty, dirty stealing. They stole that. How did... Well, okay, it was in the 1940s, okay? It's the 1940s, and if you don't know your history... Something really big happened in the 1940s, and basically um, Russia and, and and sorry sorry sorry, correct me, please correct me in the comments if I'm wrong. Please, I want you to destroy me if I'm wrong. The USSR, not the Russia, USSR took the plans 
and, and the instruments, the details, the glass, all the kinds of... And they took it as war reparations. And I know you've probably heard this from many other videos. Who cares? Big deal. Happened in the past. I don't care. Uh, try, and, try and just spend a, a second of your brain power to think about it. Okay. Japan makes a lot of copies of, of German cameras. However, the USSR copies are actually not just copies, but they're based off the plans, the, the, the machining, the, the glass that they took from Germany. So it's more than just a copy. Please understand at least that. It's more than just a copy. That's why the Zeiss Icon Super Icon to C is very important because this camera is based off it. Yes, okay, it's based off a big deal, you know? You know? Uh, Apollo 13 was based off, uh, you know? But the point is, this is more than just based off a story. This is actually more than that. So please understand the USSR, the, the East European cameras that come from that kind of Iron Curtain area are more than just copies. Okay. Rather than a clone, and unlike the Super Iconta, its solid top plate has a built-in rangefinder and a dual format viewfinder. Okay. This is super duper cool. Okay. This cam has a rangefinder built into it. So it's one of those dual rangefinders. Oh boy, what is that? Okay, let me explain it to you. So one one viewing finder is based solely on on focus it's the rangefinder right based solely on focus however that viewfinder does not have the 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 it does not have your composition okay there's one viewfinder for the focusing and there's one viewfinder for composition so there's two viewfinders that's why it's called the jewel that's why it's called the jewel baby hey hey put on that cowboy hat and pour me another that's why they call it dual range finder because one no no they call it a built-in range finder with a dual format <laughs> dual format viewfinder okay because one is designed for focusing the range finder one and the other one is composition of what the actual uh, focal distance looks like okay uh, Moskva 5 is the latest model in a series of cameras Moskva brand of the Moskva Moskva brand Main differences from the Moskva 4 in added self-timer. Who cares about self-timer? I get it. You can do long exposures. I guess that is kind of cool, but whatever. Let's keep moving on. Moskva 5 was undoubtedly designed as an expensive professional camera and not as an amateur model. This camera we're talking about was designed as a professional. And I know you're sitting there thinking, yeah, but it was, it was, it was from the USSR. <laughs> what did they ever make that was professional? Okay, you're wrong. You're wrong. Okay, and you need to just understand that that Eastern USSR glass, it's not rubbish. Those cameras are not rubbish. They're, they're not. So get that out of your brain. Okay, someone's put that in there, but it's not true. Okay, so scrap that. This stuff was was better than most other cameras. Okay, it wasn't. Maybe it wasn't as good as Zeiss. Maybe it wasn't as good as Zeiss. However, it's still amazing. It's still absolutely amazing glass. And right now, as I speak of the year 2022, I don't know what the future is going to hold, but as of 2022, not only is this glass good, not only are these cameras good, but they're majorly undervalued. They're majorly undervalued. Okay? So if you want cheap, but with good glass, keep this a secret between me and you. This is, this is amazing cameras for a fraction of the price. And you can not only thank me, <laughs> thank you, but you can thank Xenography. Xenography, the YouTube channel, that guy there, he's been saying it for years. A lot of channels have been saying it. This stuff isn't a toy. It's not a toy. It's, it's advertised as a toy. You know, a lot of the big YouTubers, I'm not going to mention them, but they treat it as a toy, but it's, it's not a toy. It's actually really, really good, and especially this older stuff. Especially the older cameras are just, they're basically Zeiss, but just with a different... Anyway, 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 oh boy. 
It was built in an age of 1956 to 1960s, when 35mm photography was already suppressing 120 film, and only professionals still insisted on using a larger format. Its dual format ca characteristics, rangefinder, and excellent lens and finish indicates professional use also. So what, what, what they're trying to say there is that this camera, when you pick it up, it doesn't feel like a toy. This camera, <laughs> this camera does not feel like a toy. Does not feel like a toy. When you have it in your hands, it feels like you've got two things in your hands. It feels like one, you have an extremely high quality camera. And then secondly, it feels like you have some kind of scientific lab. Like you're using some 1950s, you know, scientific um, apparati. Apparati? It's very high quality. Apparently these cameras were used until very late in the 1980s by Moscow Street Photographer. So, so just think for a second, 1980s, it's the 80s, <laughs> right, whatever comes conjures to your mind in the 80s, whatever's happening in, in Western culture, just imagine that at that same time in Moscow, street photography was being done by this camera. Okay, let that sink in for a bit. There are two types and two subtypes of the Moscow 5. The back of the camera showing the year of production, 1958. Two red windows for 6x6 and 6x9 numbering. The rangefinder window left and the separate viewfinder window for right. The symbols to the left of the serial number is the Krasno Krasnogorsk Company logo. Yeah, it is. 100% it is. Um, I want to move into a different topic. I'm trying to find one that actually is worth talking about. Okay, let's go through the specs. Specs. The lens is an Indostar 24. It's 110 millimeter f3.5, four elements in three groups. Aperture is 3.5 to 32, f32. Lever and scale on the lens. Focus range is from 1.5 to 15 meters, plus infinite. Focusing by a thumb lever fixed onto the lens. Oh, I'm so bored. Okay, so we've had some good look at some photos there and look it got a bit tedious man the tedium set in when I go through specs I don't care about specs like as long as it hits the basics as long as it's got the basics It's got you know a wide enough aperture to you know work in low light It's got a tight enough aperture to get some you know sharp photos You know the focal length is within reason the shutter speeds are within reason. That's all I care about outside of that. I do not care about specs Okay, now the things that stand out to me to this camera is for the for the age of the camera, the size of the lens, it's a pretty decent open aperture. It's a pretty wide aperture. Now I know people are going to flip out, and I've heard so many people on YouTube talk about, well, you know, it, the, the the wider you go, the softer it gets. So these you know these wider um, 
apertures are, are, are useless. And I could not disagree more because it's all about light. I don't care about depth of field. It's about light. If I can get a shot that might just work because I've got, I can open this thing up wide enough, I don't care how soft it gets. As long as I get the photo, it could be something amazing. I just want that ability to be able to get the photo. And this has a pretty wide aperture. And then to be able to close down to like um, 33, F33, like that's awesome. That's, you know, almost pinhole photography. You could put it on a tripod, get a nice long, you know, exposure or something like that. So it's got that, it's got, it's got enough flexibility of what I need. Now, why would you be buying one of these? Why would you go out of your way to get an old camera like this? What's the advantage? Okay, at this price point, I don't think it has any natural competitors. I don't think there is any other camera that's barking up the tree of 6x9 at this price point. You know, there might be a few weird ones like Petri or something, or, you know, like, no offense, but like a French brand or something. Nothing against French people. I'm just saying, you know, maybe some obscure brand does a 6x9. Maybe you can get a Kodak 6x9 or something. But for the price and for... the What's good about these cameras is that, to some degree, they were mass-produced. This is a mass-produced camera, so parts are plenty. They're cheap. They're super cheap, and parts are plenty. So if you had to buy three or four of them, so you could, you know, take parts from here and there and fix it up and whatnot, it's doable. You can do that. So that's the advantage of having this one. Um, is it as good as a Fujika GW690? Definitely not. It's definitely nowhere near as good as a GW690. But that's not what this is for. That's not the point of this camera. It's, it slows you down. This camera slows you down even more so than a film, just an average film camera. I personally really enjoy using folding cameras. I find that it's more of an experience. Like, you hear me go on about the, the Fujika GW690. You hear me go on about that camera forever, right? I love that camera. It's one of my favorite cameras. But... This camera has more of experience in shooting. Like, it's more of an experience. When you, when you fold out that, that lens with the bellows, oh, come on, man. Like, people just snap neck. When you shoot with a bellows camera, people snap neck. And it, and it is. It really feels like you're using ancient technology, you know, 1960s. It just feels more... Uh, it's more of an experience, okay? It'd be like driving a really classic, classic car compared to driving an 80s Corvette. They're both classic in their own right, but this is just more so. It's just a few levels deeper in the classic kind of vintage um, feel. So definitely, I think there's a big vibe to using this camera. There's a big vibe, and I absolutely dig it, and I think for that reason, it's worth it. Also, think about the flexibility of using this camera. You're able to put 35mm film through it. Now, there are videos on YouTube where people show you how to put a 35mm roll through a 120 camera, and then that's going to give you that big X-pan wide, um, you know, feel to it. It's a great lens as well. See, what I love about this lens is it's got decent resolution. It's got very decent resolution. But at the same time, it is not clinical. There is no pin sharpness to these images. They're all soft. Um, but there's just, they're warm. They've got this really organic, warm look to it. I love it. I really love it. And it's, see, this is the thing as well. If you've never shot 6x9, 6x9 is like the, you know, is just a hair away from being large format. Like it's really close to large format. So you start to get those, that vibe of, of large format vibe going on. Um, and that's that's an experience. If you if you haven't like I've shot six four five, and six four five's great, but six by nine like the two ends of the spectrum six by nine you can start to get that feeling of 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 large format, which is just like bo bo. It's amazing, you know. I absolutely love it. So if you haven't done that, that's definitely a good reason to get one. Um, also, what I love about these cameras is they're so pocket like they're so pocketable oh no pocketable is not the right word like they're so easy to take with you most of them come in this little leather pouch it goes over your neck you over your little strap and it's like it's almost like nothing it's it's almost smaller than a than a slr or a or a rangefinder camera because it's just you know it's just so small so to have the power of six by nine in a small compact design with a leather little leatherette you know holder that you can throw over your neck, like, that's sick, man, I really, I really rate that, that means a lot to me, and, um, yeah, and, I, and, and, I feel like with cameras, there's two types of cameras, there's pin sharp, clinical, amazing lenses, 
that are just, you know, nothing can come close to. There's that kind of spectrum, end of the spectrum. And then on the other end, you've got lenders that have character, that have some kind of look and character that's so, that's such a signature that it becomes special to that, to that, to that camera. And, and that's what I feel this camera has. It has a real signature look. It's this softness to it. But, you know, when you crank open that, that aperture, you do get this really swirly bokeh and it's, it's, you know, it's really nice and creamy and I don't know, it just, it has this really timeless look to it. I love it. I absolutely love it. So, um, definitely a good one. I recommend it. But just look, don't go too cheap on these cameras. Don't buy the cheapest one you can find. They are getting old. They do need a service. Mine definitely needs a service. Mine is playing up a little bit. Um, not that there's any, like, inherent problems with it. It's just old. It just needs the CLA and it probably needs a bit of a, um recalibration of the of the rangefinder and the lenses and whatnot but besides that everything's fantastic it works at an absolute charm the shutter speeds work it's got a good range of shutter speeds it's got a good range of apertures um it's everything you need right so yeah don't cheap out too much because they are cheap but don't go too cheap you know get one that works or, or at least be prepared to fully service it cla it i ordered mine from ukraine straight from the motherland um i find that's how i've ordered i've bought all my all my um, Soviet cameras as I order it straight from them because I want one I want the money to go back to them right I don't want to just buy it locally um, and then the other thing is um, I kind of feel like people people here kind of mark up like people in in Western countries mark up and go okay well I got it for fifty dollars from 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 Ukraine, but I'm going to sell it for two hundred fifty dollars. It's like, mm, come on, mate, that's a bit stiff. It's a bit stiff, mate. So I just order it now. The thing is, ordering it from Ukraine or from you know the, these these sort of um, Eastern countries is that Eastern European countries is that be prepared to wait. Right, it could take six to eight weeks. Could take more. It might never turn up. So just be a bit wary. Don't invest more than what you can, um, and be willing to know that it might not rock up or it might not be exactly as it was described or it might be a little bit worse off to wear than what you thought it was it's not you know it's not ideal but it's what you're dealing with and it's the experience when, like when i opened this one and it was covered in ukrainian um newspaper and everything dude that made my day like absolutely made my day and i'm flicking through these articles can't read any of it of course but it just feels so good and the way they package things it's just a bit of newspaper and the camera goes in and that's it it's like good luck good good luck and you just get what you get, man. And I kind of feel like that's the rite of passage. You've got to do it, man. You've got to do it. So that's how I bought mine. Um, had heaps of fun. Absolutely love it. Get into it if you can. Um, it's a, just a good little thing to have in your arsenal, especially if you don't have a 6x9, especially if you've never shot 6x9. Um, but yeah, I've got to get mine CLA'd. It's not working at the moment. And like the, the shutter fires, no problems. The aperture works, no problems. But I just feel like it's misaligned. Something's not quite right. Um... And that's the vibe I get. So yeah, so I'll have to get mine fixed up. Let me know what you think anyway, guys. Let me know down below. Hit me up in the comments. Um, tell me what your thoughts are. Talk to me about 6x9. Talk to me about anything, really. Just just get into it. Um, yeah, and I... <laughs> I'll catch you on that next one. This ain't no game. Super Mario Bros. Saturday starts Friday, May the 28th. At it's really difficult how they've written that. Starts Friday, May 28th at the theatres everywhere. Okay, I'm reading that straight from the advert. This ain't no game. Okay, guys, I just need to rant to you. Just, just a little bonus rant, right? 
Now, the new Mario movie came out. Fantastic. Awesome movie. Great cartoon, right? But I heard a lot of talk from people saying, hey, hope it's better than the original live-action Mario movie. That was a total flop. Right? That bombed. And it infuriates me because the original Mario movie was absolutely dope. That was one of the greatest all-time movies in the history of movies. And I do not know why there is so much hate for the original Super Mario Bros. Okay? I don't get where the hate's coming from. Um, so I've just, got to, I've just got to rant about it, right? You might... Look, most people disagree. I'm talking to a niche community here of niche... It's a niche on niche, right? We've got a lot of niches going on in here. But maybe someone might hear this and might understand it. Now, the first the first gripe against the original Super Mario Bros. movie is that the two main actors aren't even brothers in the movie. They're not brothers, right? Mario adopted Luigi, right? And people are, like, losing their head about it. And they're like, oh, my goodness, they're not even bros. Dude, you know what? How beautiful is it that they created a story about adopted family how how is that not a good thing how is that not just adds an extra layer to that original story and the chemistry between mario and luigi in that original it's fantastic man it's like a father and son but then they're brothers as well like it's it's fantastic oh but it's not it's not you know to the mario law you know what you know what sit down right put your pet tarantula and snake away and and listen to me for a second right who cares about the stupid Mario law? Because if you look back far enough, Mario didn't even start out as a plumber, right? He started out as all kinds of weird stuff. He was like a delivery guy. I've got an old Super Mario um, time and watch where the guy's a delivery boy, right? Mario is just a concept, right? Let's not get too stuck in, oh, but it's not official. I need to have a turtle, a dragon turtle that spits fire. Get over it, bro. Get over it. Who cares? Like, you, you know, come on, man. So anyway, so you got the two guys, they're adopted. Fantastic. Let's look at the the Super Mario Bros, right? The original live action. Costumes were absolutely five star. Costumes were out of this world, okay? S costume design's amazing. Set design was absolutely amazing. It's on par with, you know, Edward Scissorhands and those kind of, you know, cult classics. Set design was amazing on it. Storyline, I actually thought was fantastic. Two plumbers, go something goes weird in the city, they go to figure it out. It's pretty much identical to the new cartoon. And then they get sucked into this new world. Whoa, and the world is so immersive. It's got so many layers to it. Oh, but it's weird. Like, it's really weird. It's this dark, it's this dark city. Well, you know what? If you actually look at the story of Bowser, and it's pretty dark, man. Bowser's pretty dark. It's not, it's not a happy story, right? So I think it's... It's fantastic. The set design's good. The clothes are good. The, the actors, fantastic actors, man. These actors are absolutely like world-class actors, and they do a great job, right? So, so the acting's good. Um, side note, the music, the soundtracks, what was Ace of Base? Boom! Just blow it out. Was it Ace of Base? Was Ace of Base? No, Roxette. It was Roxette, man. Ha oh, whammo! They, they absolutely tore it up, bro. Roxette's one of the biggest bands. They absolutely smashed it. I, I'm telling you now, I'm looking at the poster. I still get hyped. Every time I see the poster to this movie, I still get hugely hyped. Right? They, they, they did awesome, man. Honestly, hats off to them. Now, is it a perfect movie? No, 100% no, it's not a perfect movie. Where does it fall apart? It falls apart in how it tells the story. That's where this movie falls apart. In how it tells... The actual story is a good story. But it's how the characters interact and tell the story is like... It's like you're watching an episode of Thomas the Tank Engine or something. It's, it's really bad. That's where it failed. Everything else, absolutely seamless. You know, oh, but Bowser's like this weird lizard guy. Okay, well, we've got to split hairs. Like, what's the difference between a lizard? It's still cold-blooded, right? It's a cold-blooded reptilian creature, right? Oh, but it's not a turtle. Who gives a crap if it's a turtle? Like, honestly, who cares if it's a turtle or not? It's, it, you know, and the whole thing like the de-evolution and he's like de-evolving things back to the Goombas, that's fantastic, dude, I can't get enough of it, I think it was a fantastic movie, and, and I think these guys copped way too much heat for it, and there's way too much trash talk, way too much trash talk about this movie, so, um, <coughs> <coughs> so for me, it ain't no game, it ain't no game, this is the real deal, if you don't even know what I'm talking about, if you're like, 
dude, I've never even seen the, the original live action. Number one, I feel sorry for you. Number two, you're going to find it difficult because you can't watch the live action anywhere, right? They don't have it on Netflix. They don't have it on Stan. They don't even have it on YouTube, right? No, they're like trying to delete it from history. They're trying to completely scrub it from the earth. I don't know why. So good luck trying to find it. If anyone knows where to find it, put a link down the bottom in the comments because I'd love to watch that movie again. Um, I'm dying to. Maybe I have to like look for a DVD. Oh, I'd love to have it on VHS. Oh, imagine on VHS. Anyway, until the next time. Catch you on the next one.